And so the, we proved that result, I believe. This one uh, remained, uh, I'm gonna leave this as an exercise. I might assign uh, like one whole homework problem, like two or three problems probably on this uh, today, and then you can work the details on, on this. Uh, but then the, the rest follows. So once we have this, you, know, you, can, you can solve that, that critical inequality like this. And then uh, in this example, we did, um, we did the calculation for, for uh, a decay, polynomial decay of the eigenvalues, empirical eigenvalues, and we got um, this sort of bound uh, on the um, empirical, expected empirical, uh, let's say MSE. And so for solid one, for example, this would be like two thirds, so alpha would be two. And so the, this gives you these non-parametric grades. Um, and in that case, for example, this is optimal, so this can't be improved. Uh, this, should, this shows that uh, like, up, like estimating over, if, if your assumption is only that the signal lies in the ball of RKHS, um, the problem is harder uh, than, than parametric case. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the proof of that. And then there are some results. Uh, I'm gonna skip the rest of these slides. I'm gonna post them on how uh, different operations uh, affect the RKHS. So for example, one condition is when is one RKHS included in the other? There's a simple criteria in terms of the kernel matrices. Um, what happens if I sum two kernels, the RKHS, it would be another kernel. There is an RKHS associated with it and there's a uh, norm. Uh, and in special cases, the norm simplifies to just um, like the square norm would be the sum of the two norms. And then you can use this idea to um, basically add the kernel of constant one to the minus t kernel that we had. That, that would effectively remove this, um, um, let's say boundary condition. And the effect on the norm is that you'd add just the value of f at zero squared. So that would change the norm, but then the resulting RKHS is easy to see that it's just similar to the solid of one that we had before, but no restriction at zero. So that's the main thing that I uh, uh, wanted to talk about. But then, then there are other approach, like other, other um, things that you can do. For example, there's this pullback, there's this tensor product of kernels uh, that leads to tensor product of um, um, uh, the RKHSs and then the, like the Hadamard product and so on. So I'm gonna skip those um, if you're interested. Um, you, can, you can refer to the book by, by Vern Paulson. Uh, he goes into a lot of details on that. Okay, so any questions? So what I wanna do in this lecture is to actually start talking about, start and finish basically talking about bandit problems. So um, these are um, interesting problems. Unfortunately, we just have one lecture to talk about, but let's see how we can, I'm gonna give you some main ideas. Uh, so um, they, they were introduced by William Thompson, it seems so, like in 1933. Later, the name bandit was given, but um, the context was like clinical trial. So you, you have like some drug and then you wanna test the efficacy, let's say, or toxicity. Um, you give it to a bunch of people and then you estimate the performance, like how well it does. Um, and then, maybe adjust like the dose or something, and then you give it to the next batch of people. And at some point during the trial, it becomes clear that it's either like very toxic or very like good, or like, if it's, it's very good, then like ethically, uh, it's hard to not justify like not giving to everyone. So that like there are people that are um, uh, like, they have terminal disease. And if you give them placebo, like placebo, they could die. But you, 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 at that point, you know that if you give them, they, like, there's a high chance that they survive. So you wanna sort of do this adaptation to the situation. And so that was the idea, but then the abstraction of, of the idea, I don't, I don't think these are, I'm not sure about, but uh, the, 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 these ideas are not directly applied in clinical trials, but the, like the general sort of principles are there. So you want to, Basically, um, we'll see there's this uncertain environment. The, the main difference between this 
uh, setting of bandit problems and the usual learning uh, statistical learning problems that we have been looking at. In, in, in the usual learning case, you, you uh, observe a training set. There is no um, involvement of the learner in, in the acquisition process. Or, or it is, but it doesn't change. So it's like you get, get, get IAD draws, so you just collect the images. And, and um, there's, there's no uh, interference of, of you as a learner in the data generating process. But these bandit problems model the case where um, you do adapt, and then the environment adapts to your action. So you make some um, decision, and the decision changes the subsequent observation. So it's like some sort of an ad adaptation. So you adapt, and then the environment also sort of changes its uh, behavior. So it's the difference is that you have some actions, that so the learner has some actions that, that change, um, that potentially changes future outcomes. So a, a simple sort of way of uh, mathematically modeling this is to say that we have um, the sequence of actions and rewards, let's say. So A1 is, is your action at time one as a learner. And then this is the reward that you get. This is you can think of as um, the um, move performed by the environment. So there's the learner and the environment. There is this game going on between them. So you, you pick action A1 at time one. The environment gives you reward X1. And then based on this information, you pick action A2, and then the environment gives you reward X2, and, and, and this continues. So you can model as a game between the learner and the environment. Uh, so you can think of the learner produces a t given all the information that that I've underlined here. So all the actions and the rewards so far, um, given this, uh, the learner produces a t. This could be a stochastic action. It could be a deterministic action given the, the previous um, choices. And and given everything up to this point, then the environment decides to like give you the reward x t. Okay, and then this proceeds. Um, does it make sense? So that's the, the setting. So this the sequence, if you look at just x1, x2, x t minus one to x t, or you can think of it as z, let's say, could be like the z that we had, like could contain two components, y and x, like a response and covariates. This is all the information. So this sequence is not like IID anymore. So it's complicated in general, depends on the previous actions. So your action, your actions have changed the uh, sequence of observations that you, you see. So um, there's a simplification of this model that we uh, usually make. Um, okay, so question. Uh, so are we assuming, so that's, that's a, the, the good, good question. That's what I'm doing, gonna do that. Um, so that's the general setting, but, but in all the things that I'm gonna discuss, you make the simplification that the environment is, is not, does not, does not base the action on, uh, but base the reward on the history actually. So that's, that's the next slide, good question. So, uh, so let's say sigma t minus one, uh, sorry, f f t minus one is the, all the information up to time t minus one, including all the actions and all the rewards. This you can define as formally as a sigma field. So the action is based on all the information. So that's the, let's say this information up to this point is the sigma t. Sorry, this is f t minus one. Um, so the action, uh, you can think of it as uh, a t given f t minus one um, is, is produced by a stochastic um, choice, which can be formally represented as a probability kernel or Markov kernel. So given this information, I have a distribution that tells me what the next action is, and this distribution could depend on time t. So this is the most general that you can think of. Um, and then uh, the sequences of these Markov kernels or probability kernels, uh, this, is, this is called the policy of the learner. Okay, so yeah, pi one, pi two, what, what should I do at, at time one? What should I do? So this is like the policy or the blueprint that, that you, um, choose to like pr produce the next action given the information at that point. For the environment, we're just going to model this simply as um, the reward given all the this information in AT. So 
this and AT, you're just going to assume that conditional on, on AT, the reward is independent of the path. So that's the simplification that Said also was, was pointing to. So the reward given everything and, and the action is just going to be P of AT. So uh, it's just going to be dependent on AT. Um, and so it's, it's coming from one of these distributions, P sub A, where A is the action, and action belongs to some action of space. Usually for us, uh, this is just in this lecture, just going to be K. Uh, sometimes it could be like some of the results, it could be countable as well. But oftentimes it's a finite set. And usually in that case, I, I write like new is just P1, P2, that, 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 PK. So there are K distributions. Um, these are the distributions for X. And so given that I took action AT, I'm going to observe a sample from P8 sub AT. Okay. So if action AT was two, then the environment draws something from P2 and so on, right? So basically this is saying um, XT given AT is independent on the past history, basically. Uh, and basically the uh, distribution of XT given that AT is equal to I, let's say, or A is, is PI, something like this. Um, or A if you want. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so there are some, um, so, so if you think about this, this um, sequence, um, even if the more general, we, we consider the more general case of the environment, if I specify xt given ft minus one and at, um, either the simpler model or the more general model, this would define a joint distribution on, on this sequence. Okay, so let's say I, I have the sequence up to time n, I have a fully specified joint distribution given the, these policies and the uh, procedure by which the environment chooses the uh, action. But let's say in this case, so this given the past and then this given these two, this defines the joint distribution. So from these, um, so you see like, in, like if, you, if you fix the f t minus one, you're fixing this, you, you observe like AT and then XT given AT. So this defines a joint distribution, um, XT, AT given FT minus one, okay? So given all these pairs up to T minus one, I now have the distribution of XT, XT minus one. So I can like move now, I have FT after this point and so on. So you have a full distribution by just this um, simple like, um, formula of cascading probabilities, whatever it's called, right? So, uh, so we have a full distribution, this just defines a full. This defines a full distribution for the sequence. Um, let's say AT, uh, XT, AT, T bigger than equal to one. Just this entire sequence um, is is we have a we have a well defined distribution for it. Okay, uh, questions. So there are different ways that you can achieve the same the same distribution basically, and some are simpler. So um, suppose, for example, I have an array. So in this simplified setting that we talked about, I have an array which is. Um, uh, K uh, by N, right? So this is discrete, both sides are discrete. So let's say K is three, for example. So I have these um, independent random variables and all the elements in the i all of these are drawn from PI. Right? All of these are drawn from P2. All of these are drawn from P1. All of these are drawn from P3. So one thing that, that could happen is like the way that the environment selects the reward is that uh, at time, for example, one, I have the action um, 
a, 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 a1 is one, for example, and so the environment picks this from the array. So these are all independent. And then at time two, the action is three, it goes and picks this up. And then the action, the next round is three again. And then, so, so you, you can output this sequence of um, rewards from this, uh, uh, you can think of it as a table. Um, so this, in, in this book that I'm gonna use, uh, this is called uh, random table model. So XT would be X sub AT and T. Okay, so this is somewhat natural. Um, there's another way that you can view things that um, we have the same uh, model or the same, the same array, but I'm just gonna stack all the rewards. Um, like I'm gonna pick everything from the top of the stack. So for example, the first, the first action is one. I'm gonna pick this, okay? Um, and uh, for the second action, which is um, uh, the, 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 so at the time two, uh, instead of picking this guy, I'm going to just pick the first, the first guy here. So it has the same distribution, right? And then the next round, I'm going to pick again this one. Uh, the next round, I'm going to pick um, the action is two. I'm going to pick this. And then at the next round, I'm going to pick uh, this. Okay, so you just go sequentially. I mean, there's uh, the way to like formally show that these two models are the same is to just verify that these conditional distributions remain the same. So this part, the action given the past um, is, is the same because we haven't changed the policy. You just have to verify that this, this step is, is true and, and this is gonna be true. The way that we construct the things, these are independent. So this stack of reward is gonna be simpler in some analysis. Uh, it's, it's harder to write down. So this TAT is um, uh, TA, let's say t sub a, I'm gonna write it as i for simplicity, t i t is just um, uh, basically, let's say s from one to t indicator uh, a t is equal to i. So this is the how many times up to time t we have uh, taken action i, okay? Uh, the time t, um, the, the observation, like the reward would be the, I'm gonna go in that row and then pick uh, basically how many times. So this is the second time that we're picking arm two, I'm gonna pick the second element from that. So this is stack of rewards model is what often people use in analysis. And if you have this other model in mind, it might seem strange, but, but the two models are the same. So you just have to verify that the joint distribution that they produce uh, is the same and basically just giving some thought is just this step is the same. And the other step is of, of course the same because uh, this has nothing to do with, with how you choose um, sample X, X's. Okay, sounds good. Any questions? So, um, what is the goal here? The goal is sort of to maximize the rewards, the sum of the, the total rewards, basically. Um, basically, the, the uh, sum from t equal one to n of xt, uh, and actually the expected reward um, under, under the full distribution that we have. Um, uh, instead of doing like maximizing this, usually minimize this other quantity, which is called regret. Um, this is equivalent if you try to maximize this uh, or minimize the regret because this, the first term is constant. Um, maximizing the expected sum of rewards is the same as minimizing the regret. But the advantage is that this regret, um, we can form some, some opinion about it. So how big it, it is, because there is some sort of a baseline. What is the best that you can do? So this is the first term here is the expected uh, sum of rewards. Uh, so this is under a particular policy. Um, so if, 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 if we consider the class of all constant policies, 
the constant policy just pulls the same arm all the time. Okay, so we have like if you have k arms, so these are called arms. I forgot to mention this is like um, the number of uh, actions basically. This this k is called the number of arms. So this is called the k armed bandit. Uh, why it's called that because um, like the slot machine, they call it a one arm bandit. So this is a generalization of a slot machine with a k arms. Seems so. That seems to be the argument. And so it's called a bandit because the slot machine sort of steals your money. Uh, so you can think of your. Uh, so here we're not modeling like the cost of pulling the arm, but you can you think of it as like uh, incorporated into the reward somehow. So there's some cost and there's some reward. Um, you can model, model both of them as sort of the reward. So they expect that some of the rewards for the best constant policy. Uh, is going to be n times new star, mu, sorry, mu star of new. So here, okay, so I, I think I have to, this notation might be like, again, confusing. This new is that collects all these probabilities. Okay, so that's sometimes we refer to it as the environment. So in our case, the environment is um, completely specified by this um, vector of probabilities. So given an environment um, for each arm, so there is an expectation, right? So for example, uh, if I uh, uh, if I uh, if I uh, like uh, so let's say uh, pi um, i is the constant policy of pulling arm i all the time, right? So then uh, my sort of uh, summation i from one to n, let's say x t, this uh, could be like summation, uh, sorry, t, uh, t from one to n, uh, x t, this is like uh, t from one to n, I can think of it as, as this like tabletop model, so it would be like x a t and t, but this is just x t from one to n, x i, uh, T, right? And um, then you take the expectation. The expectation would be, uh, and all of these have the same expectation. It would be just, um, that's what you use, like mu i of nu. That's the expectation of this. Uh, so let's do i here. It's really best to do it like that. So it's just the expectation of the i distribution. Uh, and then, uh, sorry, I get n times this. Um, right? All of them have the same, so n times mu i. And then uh, the best poly, the best constant policy is the one that minimizes this. So you're gonna pick the, the arm that has the smallest uh, expected reward. So uh, if, if you look at the mu star as, Oh, sorry, the, 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 you want to maximize the reward, the maximum. So mu star is the maximum uh, expected reward. And so um, this is the basically the reward of the best constant policy. Okay, n times mu star, mu star of nu. And then the second expectation is just, um, this is understood to be taken under the basically full distribution imposed by the environment and the policy. So, so this is a regret, depends on the policy and also on the environment. Um, oftentimes you just drop these dependencies, like just write, write it as R. So this is called the regret. Uh, basically the difference between the expected, so this is the regret with respect to the class of constant policies. You can define the regret with respect to other classes of policies um, by, by picking like, but by saying what is the best in that class of policy and then subtracting the expected. So, but this is, this is like this tra traditional way of doing it relative to the class of constant policies. This is the regret. And um, what you can do is, is you can ask what is the best possible like uh, regret that I can get. So it, intuitively what, what we want to do like from if you like seeing the statistics, like the statistician would, what, what would they do is like, they pick a class of environments 
a set of environments, the, the worst case over the environment, and then the, the smallest policy, like the policy that minimizes, so the minimax policy. Um, in practice, this might be hard to, to achieve. Um, so you would like settle for something like, um, for, for a given class of policy, like environments you want the regret to be um, not going. So the worst case that this could have, like, the worst case would be off being like uh, increasing linearly with n. Okay, so you you pay a constant. So the the arm that you pull, which is suboptimal, um, if you keep like pulling an arm, like just just randomly pick one arm and try to pull it. If it's the optimal arm, the regret would be zero. If it's not, then there is some sort of gap in the expected rewards, and so your regret would go like n times that gap. So the worst case is like n times. Like the naive thing would be n times um, delta. Delta is the uh, difference between the expected reward of the optimal arm and, and some other arm. Um, but but there could be policies that that do better than it. So you generally want policies that that whose regret grows like O of n, little O of n. So the the regret is so-called sublinear. So divided by n goes to zero. So you don't pay much. Uh, So better than just, let's say that, but then there's some sort of question of optimality, like how, how small can this be? So can this be, for example, big O of one? That, that can't be, but can it be like log, log N, or can it be like root N or something like that? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but you want this to hold for any new in, in epsilon, let's say, or for some new in epsilon. For some new, it would be easier, but, um, uh, for all new in epsilon, it would, would be a little more difficult. So any questions about this? So that's the goal. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give one, one like a very famous algorithm and, and try to analyze it and maybe talk a little bit about the, the possible lower bound because it's interesting. Let's see how far we can get. So the first thing before giving you the algorithm, um, the first thing is, is a simple lemma that can be sorry, a lemma that can be used to um, uh, to do a decomposition of the regret it's a very simple lemma so that's this lemma suppose uh, that's the, the 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 quantity that we define so tan is the number of uh, times that we pull arm uh, a up to time n and this delta A is the difference between that new star and new A. So um, um, I'm dropping these news here, okay, for simplicity. So mu star, so assume that we fix new, the environment. Mu star is the expected reward of the optimal R, like the maximum basically expected reward. And mu A is some, some other R, so delta A is the difference. Uh, so this is sometimes called suboptimality gap. Of, of that R. So if it's zero, it means that it has like, there is no gap. So if you pull that arm, we don't pay any price. If the suboptimality gap is positive, uh, every time you pull it, you pay like a constant price. So for countable action spaces, there is this decomposition of the regret, which is rather intuitive. So the regret is summation over these suboptimality gaps times the expected number of times that you pull that R. So it's a very natural. Um, uh, result and, and formally prove it that Sn be the summation. Uh, this should be in T of Xi's or Xt's. Yeah, so the regret is n mu star minus expectation of Sn. So you can pull mu star in using definition. It's just the expectation of mu star minus Xt. Uh, so this expectation is complicated. So Xt's the distribution is quite. Uh, complicated because they're not independent, for example, anything like that defined by the policy. But then you have this decomposition. You can write um, this next summation. Why can we write this next summation? Is there any simple reason why this is true? Can you say it again? Yeah, okay, yeah. So another way of seeing is just that 
what I'm doing is if you move it inside, this goes inside, um, basically summation A, 1, A, T equal A, this is just one, okay? Um, the action of time T is one of these. And then I'm just replacing that one here, this is times one with that, and then pulling the sum out. Uh, so now we have this expectation here, I can condition on the action at time A. So what we're doing is we're computing this uh, first condition on AT. So if I condition on AT, this indicator comes out because it's just a function of AT, so the indicator comes out. I have this expectation, right? And I'm claiming that this is equal to mu star minus mu of AT. So why is this? This thing is equal to this summation. Sorry, this, this is quantity. So mu star comes out minus, uh, the claim is that the expectation of XT given AT is mu AT. Yeah, it's just that it follows with the definition of the way that we, we actually define there the environment and the mu i. So conditional distribution of xt given at is p sub at. So if it's like problematic, you can think of it like this. Basically, xt given at equal, let's say, i or a uh, is p a by definition. So expectation of xt given at would be the, the, the mean of this distribution, which we should by definition is mu a. And then just we replace little a with just at, that's, that's how things work. And so that's, that's true. Uh, and then this is the suboptimality gap. Um, this is delta of at, but I can replace at with little a here. Why can I do that? Yeah, because of this indicator, I can do that. And um, then I, I take another expectation, right? Um, if I take another expectation on both sides, I can remove the conditioning because of the tower property. Uh, and then you plug back in um, and you can see, so basically what we show is that this is equal to expectation. Uh, so summation over A, um, So summation over A, summation over T, uh, expectation of indicator A, uh, and then delta A comes out, right? And, and this is just, um, I can pull the expectation out. Sorry, let's, let's put this here. And this is just summation over A, expectation comes out of this. It's just a t equal a, and then delta a. Okay, so this is t um, a n. Okay, somewhat simple. So what we do is like take the expectation of both sides. Uh, this side would conditioning would go away because like smoothing. Here is a smooth. So this is a form of proof, but it's very intuitive. And every time you pull arm A, you pay this price, and this is the expected number of times that you pull, and then you just sum these up. And that's what happens. Okay, sounds good. So this, this decomposition tells you that to an analyze an algorithm, it's just enough to like found expected number of times that you pull each arm, right? This delta A is deterministic. So the complexity of analysis of a bandwidth algorithm would, would be to bound these um, expected number of times that you pull an R. And uh, the, the main point is we don't want to pull. So if, if delta A is zero, so there, there could be multiple arms that have 
the same reward as the optimal arm. So there, there could be multiple, like multiple optimal arms. So for those, you don't pay a price. So you just, this would be zero. So you only have to bound the um, number of times that you pull suboptimal arms. And you want that to be like O of, little O of N, not, not, not too many times. So eventually you want to settle on the, um, the uh, um, optimal arm. So now let's talk about algorithms. So what is what are some algorithms? If, whether you have seen it or not, not, what is some sort of natural algorithm to follow here? How can we proceed? Let's say I give you, it's like a slot machine that, that has K arms. One of them, let's say, gives you maximum expected reward, but you don't know which one. So how do you proceed to find? Like online people can also chip in. Because I don't know which arm it is. It's so, for example, one strategy is a bad strategy is to pick one arm and try to like always pull that arm. Right? By by chance, you could like, do good. Um, okay, so say is is saying uh, optimism. Yeah, so that's one one thing that uh, uh, leads to um, the UCD algorithm. So one one simple idea is to try every arm once, right? At least. You need to at least try once. But then if you think a little bit about it, once might not be enough. So because of the randomness. So you might try to pull every arm a couple of times, like let's say five times each. Once you have like pulled enough, each arm enough, then you you have you can have an estimate of you can have an estimate of the news, right? So the average of the rewards that you observe for that arm that gives you a nice estimate of the new of that arm, and then based on the estimate, you're gonna um, uh, you're gonna like keep pulling the arm that does best. Okay, uh, this is called uh, in this book explore and commit. So you first have an exploration round. You explore, just go over each arm, pull it a couple of times, fixed number of times. Let's say m. Once the exploration phase fin is finished then uh, you can just get commit to that particular arm, keep, keep pulling that. And then you can analyze the regret of this. Uh, it's rather easy to analyze because things are independent, right? So you have some rounds that you just pull this and then some other round that you pull the other one. So analysis is quite simple. Um, but then the bound you can see can be optimized over the number of times you pull the arm. And if you know these suboptimality gaps, you can find the optimal like M. How many, how many times you need to pick. And then with that optimal choice, then you get a good re regret bound. Without that, it's not clear. So without that, you're in the dark. So the next algorithm, this is a famous algorithm, UCB called upper confidence bound. So avoids, avoids that like issue of not knowing how many times you pull basically. And then there's no exploration uh, like division of the steps into exploration and uh, uh, like commi committing to something. So you do both almost at the same time, but you eventually converge. So there is some sort of a trade-off between exploration and exploitation, they call it. So you wanna exploit the, the good arm, but you also wanna explore. And this, this does that. And, and as I pointed out, this is sometimes referred to as like optimism in the face of uncertainty. So um, what this is doing or what this is proposing is to maintain an upper confidence bound on each reward. So you don't know the reward, but based on how many times you pull that arm, you get a confidence bound and there's an upper bound on the confidence. So um, you pull the arm that has the highest upper confidence bound. So upper confidence means like, uh, instead of picking the lower confidence bound, you pick the upper. So that's the optimism part. So you 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 choose the you, you decide based on the best possible uh, estimate that you think uh, you have, 
and then you keep you know, pulling that arm. So the way to form a, an upper confidence bound uh, on the reward of the arm at time t is, is something like this. Um, so in this case, from now on, I'm gonna do the k arm bandit. So a is like this uh, set of all k, so one up to k, and then we write i for the, in, the action. So i is the action, generic action. And then uh, to have p1 up to like p, basically the environment is, um, gonna be ti, i, and k. So the way that you form this confidence bound, this is mu hat i t. This is your running estimate of the reward, the expected reward of um, arm i. Uh, this is just the average. So you go and uh, like sum uh, all the rewards for which the action that you took was i. And then divide by the total number. Yes. So cases, oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so this is. Um, uh, so this is the mean. Uh, and then this part um, is, is, is the confidence bound that you get from Hafteen. We're going to assume, for example, we're going to prove a result under the assumption that these PIs are sub Gaussian. Um, so let's say that these are sub gaussian let's say they're bounded, um, the randomized are bounded in zero, one, um, let's say, or the variance is one, or like the sub gaussian parameter, let's say is one, we'll see, it's like easy to write down the Hofstein bound um, with probability, this, this would guarantee that, um, um, so let me go maybe back. So anyone remembers the Hofstein bound, maybe? Suppose I have, let's say, um, uh, y1, y2 up to y uh, m, right? These are sub Gaussian. Um, you're going to assume sub Gaussian with parameter one, let's say. Okay. Uh, y bar m is one over m summation i from one to n yi. The probability that y bar m minus the expectation of one of them, let's say, uh, the probability that this is bigger than, um, let's say, alpha. Anyone remembers what that would be? Uh, something like that times M actually, okay. something like this. Um, and so if you think about this, uh, this is the same as saying that the probability that um, this plus alpha is, is like this, e, e the alpha two over M. So you can see this is, this gives you an upper confidence bound on, on the expectation, okay. So, this quantity um, guarantee. So if I if I let e, this equal to delta, right? Uh, what do I get? Um, if I solve for alpha. Uh, oh, sorry. This is. Uh, I, I want the other way around, probably. Uh, so let's see. Um, I want this to be the other way. Probably that this is less than negative alpha, right? Um, this will be true, right? Uh, yeah, so if I set it this equal to V delta, then I get minus alpha two over two M is log delta or minus, I multiply both sides by, so I get this is equal to two log one over delta, right? Alpha would be root two log one over delta divided by M, right? So this is saying the probability, the, the complement, the probability that 
y bar m plus alpha less than or equal to expectation. This is bigger than one minus uh, delta, where this alpha is just root two log one over delta over n. Okay, so y bar plus this quantity, um, and you can see it goes down like um, root one over m. Okay, uh, that, that's an upper bound on, on the expectation. Uh, like a one minus delta confidence bound. Right, so that, that's what we're doing here. So this is as a, a, uh, an average based on this many observations. And so that, that M here is this. Um, the tricky part is that this is also random, right? Uh, dependent also on the actions. Um, so this bound would be true if, if it was a fixed number. Right, so if you have a bunch of IID draws and this M doesn't depend like just a fixed or it's like an independent um, random variable, then this, would, this bound would hold conditional on M and then you can remove the conditioning. But if, if this, this number is also random and dependent on the sequence, then you have problems. But intuitively, this should be true um, somewhat. And then the, the difficulty of the result is like to show that it actually works, uh, right, with, with this random. But this is intuitively sort of clear. It should be like one over root of this because whenever you have averages, um, if they're independent, uh, then, then it goes like one over root this. It just might be that because of some dependence, uh, this might not be good, but intuitively you can imagine uh, Thing, the rewards are sort of independent. And so this sort of should, should, should hold. How to make it precise is a different story. But the, the point is that we, we maintain this. Uh, you, this is, let's call it UCBI T delta. This is the upper confidence bound on the i arm at time T uh, with, with confidence level delta. Um, and then we pick the policy is this. Pick, pick at time T, pick the arm that maximizes you see at time t minus one. Once we have that, then we update the mu hats and the UCB bound, and then for the next round, we pick the, the bound that maximizes. Any question? Um, so this is the, for the, for the, 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 uh, the teeth time, right? So uh, the, the thing is, um, uh, arg so yeah, you, you pick the bind that, ha that has the highest upper confidence bound, right? Uh, what you're saying that, are we gonna get stuck? Um, the way that you're gonna get the stack is that, the thing is, if you keep, um, so, okay, so it's a very interesting sort of question. That's the, the reason why this works is, suppose I, I keep pulling like the i r. So every time after like a certain point, I keep pulling the i r, right? What happens is that this is gonna grow. And so this confidence bound is gonna shrink. And this, is, this, this estimate also gets ac more accurate. And so eventually, if I'm stuck at this, it means that because the other arms, the band, this, this, bound, this, this band doesn't change, right? The estimate doesn't change. So it means that this mean, the mean of this, this is getting better and better and the confidence band is getting smaller. It, it means that this is always better than the best that I have for the other ones. So this has to be optimal R. Otherwise, if it's not, eventually this gets closer to the true mean this gets smaller and this drops below one of these other upper confidence bounds. And then you pick that one and then you, so the thing is the, the only reason that you would pick this is either this, so this is a nice idea. The, 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 there are two reasons that you would pick I, the i arm. Either this band, this, 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 this part is large, which means that you haven't pulled it enough or the actual mean is, is high enough, right? So if it's a suboptimal arm, you start uh, pulling it uh, uh, until you pull it enough so that this is small and this is accurate. This 
like falls below the like mu star. Um, and then at that point, you're not gonna pull that arm much anymore. Um, the only way that you're gonna keep pulling an arm is that if it's optimal. So yeah. So if delta is yeah, delta matters. So so what was what's the argument here? So, so if there, Oh, you're saying um, for um, or I guess that in this case would be a small delta or a large delta, whatever makes this term not blow up. Not blow up. So making it smaller would, would make it bigger. Right. right. So you want it to make it large, delta large. If your first draw is really bad, yes. So what? Okay, so you pick like one arm once, yeah. and delta is too large. Um, even if delta is too small, that could happen, right? So if Delta is a small, it could, gets worse even, right? So here, chi is one. Um, you're saying this is like the optimal arm. It produces a very bad first. Uh, and then, the other ones would, would, you're never going to pick this arm. Yeah, okay, so the, the likelihood of this happening should be small. That's the, right, the, the, the okay, it, it's, yeah, possible. But the point is, the, the likelihood that this being bigger than every other arm uh, and like remaining bigger than every other, or that should be small. Like this is like, um, because we are looking at the expected regret, right? So it's like the expectation, it's not under all circumstances. I think if delta is too large, then the UC algorithm can only converge to some arm that is. Uh, yeah, it's good. It's, it's a good point. Um, delta has to be a certain uh, range. Let, let's, let's go through the proof, right? Uh, we'll see like where the delta comes in. It matters, yeah. Um, it's, it's a good point. I'm not sure what would happen in general. Um, if delta is too large, what would happen? But, but the thing is that we're looking at the expected regret. So, um, so on average, this shouldn't happen. So like in a particular case, it might be, I guess. But uh, the probability that, that that happens has to be like very small, right? You're right. It could it could happen. It's an interesting point. But let's go through this. Uh, it shows where where different things um, come in. So uh, that's the point that I mentioned that um, uh, UCB is high if you have an inaccurate estimate or if if uh, the value of mu i is actually large. And so you you keep either like improving your estimate or you're basically this is like the exploration and, and then you also like gain a higher, or you gain a higher reward actually. So basically doing this automatically does the exploration or exploitation depending on which, which of the two situation happens. Um, so this is the result. So if, if you take Delta to be like one over N square and, and we'll see where this, this comes from, there, there could be other choices as well. We can chat like about that later, uh, but, uh, the the 
decay armed uh, banded under a one sub Gaussian environment. Um, for any fixed horizon n, if you take the delta to be this, then, then the degree is bounded like that. Uh, so this part is uh, sort of the sum of these so orthogonality gaps. This is sort of unavoidable because you have to fill pool like each arm at least once, so up to a constant this should be there. Uh, and this is saying that uh, if, if the deltas are fixed, this is saying that regret grows like logarithmically, which is, which is very nice in N. So you get, um, so this is a bound that depends on a particular instance. So if you fix the instance of the um, problem, to fix a particular environment, these deltas are going to be fixed. So this is a constant and it grows like log n, which is sort of optimal in this sense. It's like we don't talk about this part, but um, if you let, if you want to do like a minimax, if you want to minimize over, like what is the worst case over like a collection of uh, environments? Let's say the, the, the rewards are like the, the means, the mu i's are all bounded in zero one. Um, and you work with all the S G banded problems. This, this term would be problematic because I'm gonna to try to maximize over all possible things. This could blow up. Uh, we could we could do a different bound that, that would be optimal in that case. Uh, I'll talk about that hopefully. Well, let's go through the proof. Um, the proof is very interesting, like the way that these, uh, it's a little bit non-intuitive, but the, the point is we're gonna work with this stack of rewards model. And um, so the reward at time T would be, uh, if you recall that the stack, uh, basically, um, I have the stack and I'm just picking uh, from the top of the stack for different arms, right? Uh, and so if I, if I look at, let's say, um, basically the average up to time T um, of, of the I throw of the stack, that's mu hat I T. So this just sums over uh, the first T elements of the I throw. Uh, and then I also define a UCBIT, which is uh, basically the upper confidence interval based on uh, this, this T sample. Okay, so this is deterministic. There's no, uh, there's no like this part that the upper, the confidence part, the band is uh, deterministic. Okay, so what happens is that the actual mu hat I uh, is going to be the mu hat. Uh, the, the, the end point is not known, but the, the end point at time t would be pit, how many times I, I pulled that r, and the ucd it and delta would be, again, I plug t here to be pit. Okay, so that's sort of, there's this randomness going on. So I'm not, I'm not looking at the estimate or the ucd at a fixed time, but at a random time, which is um, dependent, or a random quantity, not a random time, like random, discrete index, which is dependent on how many times I basically pick that up. So that's the difficulty of, so we need to decouple this PIT here uh, uh, from these, these two random variables. Otherwise, um, the distribution of mu hat i sub PIT is, is complicated, right? Uh, because because both, both depend on, on the same sequence. Now the trick is something like this. So without loss of generality, assume that mu one is mu star. We define these good events. So D is uh, the event that uh, UCB one T delta, this is the actual UCB bound. For the first arm, this is bigger than mu one for all T. So this is saying uh, that the often confidence bound at all times up to time N um, uh, works as expected for mu one. Okay, that's, that's one event that will show that this is gonna be uh, good enough, like, sorry, the probability of the complement is small enough. And the other one is that under this event, um, uh, we assume that the, the additional good condition is that UCBI at some UI, which is to be determined, this is a deterministic index. And so we go, for each arm, we go uh, up to a certain depth, 
right? So this is like U1, this is gonna be U2, this is gonna be U3. And the, the UCV bound up to that depth uh, is gonna be below mu1. Okay, so, so at that basically, let's say index or at that time point, it's not the time, but at that index, we have a good UCV. So this, this drops below the mu1, so we're not gonna pull those arms anymore. So the main, the main idea here is that on GI, the number of times so in this event, the number of times that you pull arm i is bounded by ui. Um, it's sort sort of intuitive because uh, once you hit this, if ti hits mu mu i at that point, this this is going to drop below this, so you're not no longer going to pick it. The, the issue is that I can come back and pick it more, right? But but there's this little. Uh, okay, can you remind me? Okay, mu one is just um, that these are the expected. So this is expectation, expected reward, reward for arm one. So what we're assuming is that arm one is the optimal arm. So mu star is the maximal reward. So mu one, so we, we wanna say that eventually we're gonna pull arm one. Uh, uh, U, yeah, U one, you're talking about U one. Um, so you, you uh, there's the UI, right? There's U1 up to UK. So these are numbers to be determined. So these are how far in the stack I'm gonna go for averaging. Um, so this is, as I mentioned, there's this, this thing. So this is determinist, not deterministic, but it goes up to a fixed index as opposed to a random index. So the, the, the number, um, like how many how many of these I'm gonna uh, take the average over? So that that's that's the the UI. We're gonna determine that. This is just a deterministic index of how far we're gonna go. So this is like k by n. What I'm gonna do is that in each uh, row I'm gonna go up to a certain depth, let's say, and and then average those and then com compute the confidence bound based on those. That's that's what the u1 up to uk is and then to be determined later. So you're gonna assume this is this, is this guy um, and this is this guy, okay, for, for the first guy. Uh, okay, so let's try to do this. Um, the, the, main, the main result is this. So if, if this happens, then the number of times you pick uh, the i arm is at most ui and then you can choose ui to be small enough, right? So um, for the... Um, Basically, you just have to worry about the suboptimal arms for the optimal arm. It doesn't matter how many times you pull it. But uh, okay, so if if um, u i is bigger than or equal to n, then then things are trivial because you're pulling at most n times. So assume that u i is less than n, um, and then we prove by contradiction. Suppose t i is bigger than u u i, um, then there exists a t in 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 one up to n such that Ti is ui plus one. So if, if I pull more than ui, then there should be at least like a time at which I'm ui plus one, like pulling ui plus one, which means that at, at the previous time I've pulled it, like at the previous time up to that point, I've pulled ui times and at time t I'm pulling it one more, right? At time t, a t is i, uh, at time t minus one, ti sub t, t minus one, this is, um, keeping track of how many times I have um, pulled that arm up to that point. So this has to be UI, and at time T, I have to pull the arm for, for this to happen. Okay. Um, like, not, not for, this is the first time, basically, the first time that this happens. And, and the first time that this happens, that, that happens. So let's, there exists a T, let's call this, there exists the smallest, smallest t. The first time that, that we hit ui plus one, um, these two other conditions have to be satisfied. Then you see i at t minus one delta, uh, that's the confidence bound at time uh, t minus one. This is by definition u c b i t i t minus one. So this is uh, my notation for this, right? So the u c b, this is by definition, right? u c b, um, i t and delta is u c b i t i t 
So this is by definition equal to that. Uh, by assumption, this is equal to UI. Okay. And um, on there, the good event, this is less than U1. And also because we are under, so GI includes D. So this is also B less than UCB1 T delta. Okay, so if you just look at these, these um, the main point is that um, for that particular T, this random UCB would be just the UCB uh, um, IUI at that deterministic point. Uh, and because that's less than mu1 on the good event, and, and mu1 is less than the UCD of the first arm, then it means that uh, at that point, at t minus one, the UCD bond on the ith arm is less than UCD one, so we couldn't have called the ith arm. That's the contradiction. Uh, question? Do you have any questions? So it's, it's the tricky, this is the tricky idea, how to decouple basically. Uh, you, you show that if this happens under this good event, um, um, if, if you pull more, then there's this contradiction. So you couldn't have, this is by the definition of the UCB, uh, the action at time I cannot be the I R. Sorry, the action at time T cannot be the I R. So this is a contradiction, so that, that should hold. And so the rest is sort of um, controlling these probabilities and then using the regret decomposition. Let's do it quickly. Um, so if you go back to the proof, so we have the lemma. Now let's control uh, the probability of the complement of these two events. The complement of D would be, um, so this is saying for all T this has to hold, so the complement would be there exists a T for which uh, the UCD of arm I goes below the expectation. Uh, this is by definition what I had there. So it's UCD one uh, at, at that index. And then this, this would be equivalent to saying that, um, uh, so there exists a time for which this happens is equivalent to saying there exists an S in N such that ucb one s uh, so this happens. Uh, so, so if you think about this, um, what this UC, this is doing is that uh, this is saying, um, so we have UCB for every uh, element here. The, the actual thing is that we, we, we choose some of these. So this UCB, this guy is basically some of those UCBs, right? This is, UCB at index, for example, at time t could be like we pulled it uh, once and then at time. Um, uh, so it's, it just goes up to, um, I made it, made it bad. Uh, so it goes up to like UCB one S up to the maximum times that you, you pull this R. So it would be like uh, one, two at most like N. So, so it's, it's easy to argue that this is the case. So there exists an S such that that holds. Now these are deterministic UCBs, so we can we can work with. Um, so then the probability that uh, UC happens uh, is less than or equal to summation s from one to n. The probability that one of these happens. Um, this is just a Huffstein bound. Okay, this is a Huffstein bound based on. So these UCBs are like deterministic. So this is just a Huffstein bound. By Huffstein bound, this is going to be bounded by delta. And so this is going to be bounded by n delta. Okay, so the tricky part is again translating this random UCB, like doubly random UCB to this singly random UCB. Um, so that's the case. And then for the other one, um, so the complement of this event uh, is saying that UCB, uh, the ith arm at uh, index UI, is, is less than mu1. So the complement is this, the probability, this is, this is the complement, right? Uh, I'm gonna subtract, so you see the I U I is just uh, mu hat I U I minus um, a plus root two uh, log one delta U I. Um, 
so the probability that this is bigger than mu one, I'm going to subtract uh, mu hat i from so mu i from both sides. Uh, that's the same as actually this is equal to this. Uh, this this side this is going to be delta i. That's this. Um, so I get the probability that mu hat i u i minus mu i. Uh, I'm going to move this to the other side. This to the other side. Uh, bigger than mu one minus mu i minus root two log one or delta u i. Uh, this is this is delta i. Uh, I'm going to assume that this is at most c delta i. Or sorry, this is uh, at most uh, one minus c delta i. Okay, then then this is this is going to be bounded by the probability that mu hat i u i minus u i is bigger than c delta i. So I want the basically the, the gap here um, to cover this this error. So uh, what we're going to assume is that the gap basically this guy uh, delta i minus the confidence bound is bigger than c delta i. So our um, confidence bound is basically, um, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be like bigger than the, the suboptimality gap for, for this to, it's, it's sort of intuitive if, if you write it down. Um, so in the end, if, if this condition holds, so I, I'm gonna choose UI such that this holds. This is where I'm gonna choose UI. And uh, if, if UI holds, then this, this, this is gonna be the case. So, this is going to be bounded by that. And this is just, again, a deterministic of team. So it's going to be bounded by uh, this squared. Um, this is going to be bounded by uh, e to the negative. Uh, how, many, how many elements we're adding up or taking uh, into account into the, in the average, that will be this. It's ci of the squared over two. Uh, and uh, then you can go and check that. So, so if you put, put, put everything together, so the probability of the complement of this would be the complement of this plus the complement of this. That's the uh, union bound. So you get N delta from here uh, and the other bound that you have here. Uh, and then you can also see that this condition, um, the smallest UI would be, you can calculate it, it would be something like that. Um, Okay, so we have the UIs that we want. We don't, we don't want UI to be too large. That's the upper bound on the expected number of arms that we pull on the good event. So UI calculate from that, uh, we have this upper bound. So you now plug in everything here. So the expectation of, sorry, I'm gonna move a little bit fast. This expectation, I'm gonna split it into the indicators of GI and GI complement. Uh, on the first good event, this is the lemma. This is going to be bounded by ui. Uh, on the bad event, we're going to bound it by n. So you get n times this complement of the probability, like the probability of the complement of the event, which we have, um, you plug it in here, okay? Um, and then I have the uis. So you, get, you can see there's this n here outside, and then there's this. Uh, and then I plug in the uis from that uh, expression that we had here. Um, and so you expand, sorry, expand, you can see that there's this n squared delta here. So delta appears there. And also plug in ui, I've defined this to be alpha. So you can also see that there's the delta that appears here. So in the end, once the dust settles, you get this result. Okay. Then you have to choose, uh, okay, all right, I'm gonna leave soon. So, with the delta, so if, if delta is uh, like larger than one over n squared, this is gonna produce a polynomial term. So, so we kill that with, with delta in one over n squared. And then you can also see that uh, this would be like n to the one minus two alpha. Uh, so you can take alpha to kill that term as well. There's, there's some choice here that alpha equal to one works. Um, and so these would be constants uh, and then I add one to remove this bracket here. Uh, so you get three here, and then 
once you put like plug in delta like one over n squared, you get 16 log n over delta i, and then you plug back into the regret uh, decomposition, which is this. You only need to do it for delta i's that are not zero. Um, one of these delta i's cancel out here and you get a delta i, so you get this result. Oh, sorry, you get the result. Okay. Um, so we are out of time. Uh, there is another like simple modification that you can make to avoid that reciprocal of delta. So you get very simple argument you can go through. Uh, you get root nk log n. This just has this extra term, which is unavoidable. So this root nk um, cannot be improved. So this, this you can take supremum over all, let's say, delta, like a maximum over all the things that have suboptimality gap bounded by one. And this gives you a, a minimax upper bound of root nk log n. And then you can show a lower bound root nk. Uh, and then later on, you can remove the log n as well by an algorithm. So this, so this is sort of the minimax. Uh, this part is the minimax rate. So Rn would be um, like the supremum over a class would be uh, at most this. So the UCD achieves uh, uh, like the minimax rate over uh, a sub-Gaussian class. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. Sorry, you went over time, but uh,